grandmother and my grandfather. Oh, God. Uh, who, my grandfather was born in Puerto Rico, but he moved to the States when he was 17, and he was here for about 40 years until he went back to the island. Uh, my grandmother, who was born in the States, she grew up in the Bronx, New York, and then later she went to Manhattan. And uh, then it'll be a bit of a mix with myself uh, and my upbringing growing up in Newark and trying to see how, although my grandfather was in uh, on his island and my grandmother was in New York and I was in Newark, we all kind of tell the same story or we have some sort of lineage beyond blood that is the threading of just our own experiences. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to give you guys some poetry vibes. It's on my shirt. <laughs> Fire setting. Uh, Only we would remember I was spawned out of that house. Through hollow corridor, a wet toddler palm print still yoked across its surface. Cleaning hands won't make sense of rubbish, like we made sense in sepia of old Spanish westerns. Our eyes smiling against daylight's glares on the tube TV, and we'd share the same dust caught through the slices of bright, deceiving grandpa's curtains. Nor would the excavator trucks of this home hear the echoes of Oscar de Leon calling and responding to the hissing of his steam. Grandpa's iron clicking when it stood up. We only knew how to keep tempo by the brushings of his brooms, by the pounding Ajax containers as we <laughs> shook our hips. The smell of diesel will overtake everything, soft boiled into an impressionable black. All that be left Stale smells of fire, not the aroma of breakfast. Pan con mantequilla, chunks spat out of my mouth in grandpa's second hand chairs. Redwood, stale smells of fire, not the aroma of dinner. Newports, beer, ice cream, steaks frying in mojo. This small house in Newark, one scorched like the sun, wooden paneled guts, the color of old trumpets. Now rough in color, now avocado skin. And I will remember the room where Sabalo Gigante played on Saturday nights. The blue light reflecting off brown walls, off brown me, off brown him. And that world was now burned to be scraped clean by hired hands that won't know which closets that kept towels and which ones kept his tools. My photographic memory, the last effigy of his work shirts hanging in a closet, the last house to call him a renter. I called him up on the phone and said, Grandpa, your old house caught fire. Thank you. All right. All right, daily becoming. Like the same Maya West rock, my grandfather moves from one side of his house to the other side of his house just to keep busy. It would, be, it would just be easier to distinguish inhales between his exhales, the hands that rebuilt his old mother's house, Genepa spawning overnight in life green. In these moments of living, proof of flesh serves as a halo, the shape of the cheapest red kidney bean that feeds our daily becoming. It should be easier to define one's path to that winning lottery ticket, but dreams at his feet only reflect the chasing of beads around a rosary. Eventually, he stops running, even if he misses it. Oh, how he says it felt like flying, how he only flaps his fingers now filled with nourishing fruit while respecting the movement of his rocks. Despite that, he says, finalmente los pichones le robaran el aire. At the end, the pigeons will take every breath. He will continue to respect grass in his yard as the blades always reach towards the sun. Anyone like baseball in here? That was my first sport and it made me hate it. Now I'm starting to like it. Because, uh, I got my head caught up to the rest of my body, so now I have set of bounds. Uh, there's a conversation that me and my grandfather had about baseball all the time. <laughs> baseball is compass. The first sport that taught me how to keep the bench warm. It was pure chagrin, eye black, asserting itself at tips of still maturing cheekbones. Sweat beads of salt snaking down my young stubble. It was not the sport of mine, it was a sport of my father's. 
A bat the color of cigar paper, dug out of a small wooden box, a Yankee ball cap on every coat rack. They were as much of the MLB as I was no longer Cuban, as much as I was my mother's child. Mom never played sports because grandma never played sports, so because of that, I never wanted to play sports. Home plate was my favorite, though, and it was the one she always cooked at six. <laughs> Until I was 12 in the kitchen, I ate two pork chops before I went trick-or-treating. <laughs> I was a football player that year when the kids on the street heckled and my Giants jersey, Dodgers bottoms, homemade costume. Baseball took Grandpa back to his childhood dreams on the island, on the west tip, where he didn't know baseball had already found him. In a formation of mothballs going out to play, Grandpa and his brothers scuttling out of their concrete shack to cut the mountains of clothes that grew in their east where they learned that whites like the soak of bleach. Grandpa's poppy taught him to find the perfect rocks on the porch and the art of slamming stone against tropes of color. Grandpa named himself the closer of their dry cleaning business. Working on the swing in his arm into pigment, though he was only destined to watch the other kids, he wished to be on that field too, peeking through the galvanized fence jealous of his adolescent shoulder, never flexing the complicated musculature of his own similar pattern. Printed onto these clothes, he ruined thinking of the same fastball. I knew I didn't like baseball because it showed me unworthy to make this my life the way Grandpa compared baseball to clothes, to people, how I mistaken a single tear down his cheek for a beard of this painful sweat when he calls me 45 years after leaving to call me and to tell me and to remember that one group bleeds and this other group bleaches. In his kitchen sink, white shirts and linen soaked with this bleach, he says the same phrase again and again in his best Clint Eastwood. <laughs> Wisdom only known while washing off my batting gloves for this third season, fighting the same stain out while all of his other clothes lie there Dirty in a milk crate. <laughs> Baptism. Uh, he also, once he moved down when he was 17, did a couple odd jobs until he was 19, then he got a job at a factory in Passaic. And um, the most proud moment he had when, when he was like 59 and they finally made him manager and they gave him a key. And uh, he still holds on to that. So. A lot of what I work with is also the working class um, literature and consciousness and um, how we measure success. Right? Baptism. In a factory where a flood zone ruined my grandfather's third Toyota Corolla. In a flood zone factory, workers called him Papa Dios. Every storm was a fight for his belongings. This time was his wallet swimming in the Passaic River. A school picture of himself, water up to his neck, cut, stitch, Press, package, cut, stitch, press, package. 60,000 folds an hour, 20,000 packages sealed a day. He didn't worry about numbers as long as his job was only to walk, walk, walk on water, heaping shopping carts of linen back and forth. He agreed to do this job when he signed the liability. 19-year-old fingers like papaya slices. Musky water, he dropped the paper from fear. From moving out of Diaz's cramped Manhattan studio. From promise, from finally escaping slum. Never to wade through this black water again, unless if he said he would. As on this day, floating like paper, like the city around him, again in another world, he finds himself reaching for what makes him all other utter hombre when he walks into work the next morning still wet one more day older the picture still in his hand the car still somewhere swimming <laughs> Papi Pichong flies out of my library book and no one understands him because he talks at Spanish to English dictionary speak all this Miss Poppy's beautiful wings, a saber, a grindstone attached to his gold-plated breasts, a picture of many beers emptied across a flag on the wingspan of a flying rat. Sing Vilwensa, he fluffs his feathers and juts his pecker at an unknown roost, singing, Mira, 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 I got your stereotypical boricua right here, pointing at its pigeon butt. 
If he had a crack, it'd be the fault line where the carpet baggers met the island. The winning lotto ticket my grandmother never scratches flies out of that same book and Papi Pichon gobbles it up. It's been a long time since we've seen real gold and not a publisher's clearinghouse sold dream. It's been longer since the Puerto Rican was as smart as the new American since coplas, decimas, y bombas, fetishized por Incan, reinas, and creole babies. Show me royalty, Father Pigeon, before you go up in these flames. Before you are burnt ash, buried underneath more history, where Ricky Martin, J Lo, and others sit on your pile of dust because you can still sing louder. Fly me to the antiquity that collected the dust of gold for your angels in Bonse, harvesting coca to make our heartbeats beat faster than our feet stepping to the conga in North New Jersey. Papi Pichon wants me to follow him past Oscar Lopez Rivera during the Puerto Rican Day Parade, before Commonwealth, before the Bronx burnings, when we squawked like coquis, before colorless, before this gold, before our sea of earth learned to speak Spanish. So got a pulse? I want everyone to hold their hand over their heart. What you are holding is a tool. It's the key that you find at the bottom of a drawer slightly stuck to wood. What you are holding is your nourishment. It is every ice cream cone you have ever had, every memory of happiness, every elusive brain freeze. What you are holding is a megaphone compressed into many letters. What you are holding is a family of words that becomes permanent in the language of love and hope and in the presence of grief. You hold an object yelling for the sake of an alleviation, an awareness, an acceptance. You hold experience, you hold fear, and you hold joy. What you are holding in your right arm is life. The piles of finger hut books were emerald. Telemundo played. She watched security break up a fight. The wife was sobbing emerald. The husband's red face blamed emerald. Laura threw him out and all the women became emerald. The Spanish news talked about a riot in Ecuador. 60 people were emerald. My dinner was served. Italian frozen chicken fingers and fries. They were frozen, but they were fried with little black chunks of black from Tuesday's pork chops, too. <laughs> the oil on the fingers felt like emerald. It was kept in a pickle jar to reuse, and it was made in an emerald image. The wrestler on TV got hit with a steel emerald. Comments about a grandmother and her mother watching Rowdy Roddy Piper hit Superfly Snooker with a coconut on Piper's pit. Eddie Guerrero shouted, I'm your poppy, in a lowrider that resembled an emerald. The peanut shells cracking on her bed sounded like emerald. A boy ate his Elio's pizza as a midnight snack. It was warmed from the microwave. Doritos were pressed into the artificial emerald, one part soggy, one part crunchy. Mm -hmm. everyone, was, everyone was in bed, and they rested on emerald. Action figures sat sleeping, mouths gnarled, aggressive faces. On the edges of shelves, Porcelain muñecas slept standing in moth-eaten cloth. Their southern bell dresses stared into darkness, stitched in emerald. Butter, bacon, and bread in an orange or blue morning. The eggs were frying emerald. The house woke up in emerald, got dressed in emerald, ate like emeralds. The bathroom was fresh from Marlboro's and coffee, and it was in a smoky emerald. They shopped every weekend, the black tights, black windbreaker, black skippies all wore an emerald. The cartridge in a Game Boy was Pokemon. Pixels on the screen read, Bloom evolved into emerald. Emerald was the hand that held that child with the weekends that always left too fast. The ID card swipes emerald to start all over again. Punched in the hospital, the picture is plastic, photographed in emerald. The, her cleaning cart had emerald many times. The uniform was also colored in emerald. Eleven rooms were serviced that day. All had emerald all over.
negative spaces in a wave of color going through the forehead between blurry, between what is clear, ears that speak, a mouth that listens with a chin that helps, lips that open but still blurry. These thoughts of the rosado y gris, the head, the scalp, and the light, and the deli shelves in the grocery store at Miguel's, the wick cheese, the eggs, the milk, the 16 ounces of sliced bread, and those fun cubano memories. The flecks that were toasted over and burned over a fire on a chin with coffee at the table. The shoes, the books, and September 4th that was all paid on a credit card. They too ate at this table. And the words to me, I'll pay it next week, me, are also blurry. I am here. I am working. Watch the ants climb out of the foundation like escape secrets. Don't kill them on the porch. Each insect that dies is a memory we will lose. This house is civilization above concrete. Hear me in ravenous storms. Falling garbage cans and the dropping of flowers sound the same. I am here. I am orchid so nature could marvel my sequels. Remember the nation in my hands. Follow the sense of house. Blender red is agi dulce before bleeding into green. I am this sofrito, I am rain clean when I take my last plant breath. So shut your eyes because I am still orchid when I die. Okay, right. spin cycle. All right. Um, on Wednesdays, I would always go to this place in the neighborhood. They would do 99 cents for a spin site, like for washing in the morning. I took this to workshop, and my uh, advisor got really upset because he's like, don't all the mamas go on the weekends? But I was like, not if you want to pay 99 cents. <laughs> Wednesday morning. Little children playing hooky with their mother's permission. It's 99 cents for a wash. Mothers and their mothers will be here all day watching Mickey Mouse Clubhouse cable for free on three TV screens. English, Spanish, and closed captions. Are how the cows do the can-can, a duck and mouse in dresses. Mothers and their mothers can't afford to pay full price while the lavanderas fold towels. Kids ducking under and over laundry baskets, threw them like an amusement park, hiding in these special hiding spots that the adults can't reach, out of reach of anyone over these 36 inches, still in range of Mickey's, oh boy, and these Capri Sun commercials. Lavandera stocking fabuloso, madres making math out of maquinas, stuffing five cubic feet of clothes into basins that only suggest for. This temple is teaching. It is heat. It is a recitation of plagal chants from the quaking of these spin baskets. Washerwomen watching these machines. Mothers watching these children watching machines. Como mass. Soft hums on the flat screens. Cleanliness teaching kids how to be clean as animals. This bleach teaches godliness. A question, what happens when the clubhouse is closed for business and the laundromat stays open? When these children figure out that they are the animals that do the cleaning? And what will they do when there is no emotion? When washers keep spinning on their farm and they're their own workers that keep working and this troop that keeps preaching, that keeps folding, pressed with steam in the morning, and it's only worth 99 cents. Which is Bruce? In the kitchen, she pours them coffee. He watches out. Uh, he washes out the cloth filter. Their metabolism pulls them back 45 years. Cooked in their first apartment. He had been a spoon standing in boiling water since origin, skimming in a field of Goya. Standing erect as a flag on land that was boiling beneath him, their bruises hidden underneath bronze and grease, only half exposed when she polished their aluminum. 
his voice steel wool buried under the gravel of alcohol, expelling quantities of bastards down at the factory, at the store, at the bank, cursing those buildings that started to curse their family. When they were angry, his lips remained raisined, an asshole where shit spewed. Her lips remained ripe, a water tomato still 19 days old, thrown against the wall or eaten in several bites, once she suppressed a beautiful witch that used to live inside her. Knocking at her skull, she would want to show up to stir the rice in this cauldron, longing to conjure a cardero off its black soldered grate, to toss it out the window, still in her nightie over her left shoulder, will bring back her night school. And the way that the husband might have taken it away, she tells this bruja no, for every back and forth of this scraping metal, the best pot of rice is for the hungry in her eyes, and the grains of rice are offered to fit between the grit of everyone else's teeth. Alright, I'll close out with these last two. Shadow boxing. In his youth, Grandpa Pummel, the Campo wise guy, calling each jab a gift to bet and drink on the dimes of every other man beneath him. My family's legacy consists of fists clenched tight to wallop and maim and ball up the shamelessness boiled into our spines. Boxing was the product of our design, conceived in this brine. Every one of my swings, a comida del pobre, story to swallow in this fighting game where I'm throwing hands in a high school bathroom for petty fame. Generations of island men created in the cockpits of backyards or back alleys of clubs. And here I am with my opponent against the urinal, smelling stale Cheerios and regarding all the old men from the block saying, hit him with the bolo when he's got his guard up. Through the art of a fist to chin connection, human can make human's blood trickle down slow like aloe, gushing succulent. In these moments, I question where my hands have been, swollen tendons making mountains of blueprints with spit and teeth, knuckle skin graft on another man's lips I wear as a flag. I receive no answers, but who am I to wait for my hands to speak? A sack of daggers, a double-edged legacy set to perpetuate a sparring with myself. My shadow is my only resistor. Every bob and weave is a whistling of my own whisper. All right, that's my last one. Thank you all for being so receptive. This one's called Summer Avenue. You taught me there is no God, no life after this life. So I know you are not watching me type this letter above my shoulder. That's by Martin Spock. Summer Avenue, letter. One, street corner, this is a letter. Two, today I lie next to you where your weeds loiter between the seasons. Three, turn me over in this bed I have made of soda and spare time. Make me visible only to those who can still walk all over you. Four, I miss the corner store dates where ten Swedish fish always cost a dollar. Feasting on gummies until the sun went down. Fish swimming down the drains of our throats for freedom. Five, I can run my hands down the small of your back and broken ridges down your storm drain. Six children chalk up pistols, water bullets waiting on pinchos. Their mouths open are the suns that melt cherry ices for only a quarter. Six empty chip bags and tiny plastic baggies are embraced by dirt, snuggled in your hug, a fertilizer made with the richness of everyone else's blood. Eight sneakers spin on your line, lynched like a weather vane, and you wear them as a beautiful necklace. Nine, a cat's last breath is stolen on your doorsteps, cracks and potholes filled with its flattened bodies. Ten, I can carbon date silhouettes of the dead layered in the chalk, reading as far back as my grandmother remembers. Eleven people pick you piece by piece for every funeral your street corner has ever curated. Twelve in the morning, someone cracks you open like a walnut, you spill out and cover us with the color of the living. Thirteen ways to meditate, to eat and drink your asphalt, to worship the fumes of gods from spray cans, to learn the way we love 
in the street corner stupor. 14 is to fill the gaps of me with the memory of you. Thank you.